We'll be uh, quiet, please, so we can, the witness can be heard. He deserves to be heard. My support for the nomination of Judge Robert Bork to the U.S. This may be the most important Supreme Court nomination of our time, not simply because the present court is so closely divided, or even because Judge Bork is the most highly qualified nominee of this generation, but because this is an historic crossroads as regards the expanding power of judges, which is to say the erosion of people's rights to govern themselves democratically. Gradually but steadily over the past 35 years, more and more decisions have been taken out of the hands of the American people and vested in courts. Those preoccupied with the merits or demerits of the specific issues raised in the cases involved pay little attention to the general drift away from accountable representative government. The ad hoc way many of these landmark cases of this era were based on legal principles improvised for the moment has meant that law itself has become more and more a matter of how judges happen to feel politically or socially about particular issues or particular litigants. No one has opposed these judicial trends more consistently or more ably than Robert H. Bork, first as a scholar and then as a judge. Mr. Bork has rejected the idea that judges should engage in heroic adventures in policymaking, as he calls it. The renunciation of power, he has said, is the morality of the jurist not the assumption of power in the name of morality. What Mr. Bork has fought against consistently over the years has been, in his words, government by judges who are not applying the Constitution. The statistics thrown around recklessly as to how Judge Bork has allegedly voted against women X percent of the time or for some other class of litigants Y percent of the time are no more reliable than the definitions used by the special interest sources from which they come. Arbitrary definitions are no less arbitrary when they are expressed in numbers rather than words. Taking these box scores seriously reflects either a dangerously naive gullibility about statistics or an even more dangerously cynical view of the truth. The same kind of box score approach has been used against Judge Bork in the racial area, except that all the things Mr. Bork has done to advance the civil rights of blacks and Asians are either ignored or played down, while every legal question he has raised about any portion of any civil rights law or court decision has been automatically defined by his critics as being anti-civil rights or anti-black. Obviously, I wouldn't be here if I believed any of that. Civil rights need to be understood not simply as a special benefit to minorities, but as something essential to everyone. Civil rights define a civilized and humane society. State-imposed discrimination was central to the racial oppression of blacks during the Jim Crow era in the South. Judge Bork opposed this central focus of racial discrimination, from Brown v. Board in the 1950s to Washington v. Davis in the 1970s, to his work on the Court of Appeals in the 1980s. His criticisms of particular parts of particular laws and court decisions have often been in terms of the extension of constitutional rules from the government to private individuals and non-governmental organizations. These serious legal questions are by no means confined to Judge Bork. The law journals and law books have been full of controversies for decades over so-called state action. It was precisely this principle which many raised in the restrictive covenant cases, which are not simply cases about whether you are for or against housing discrimination. Demagoguery on this point is especially uncalled for, since no one, as far as I've been able to tell, has ever seriously advanced any evidence that Shelley v. Kramer or Reitman, or Reitman versus Mulkey made any discernible difference in racial housing patterns. The question is whether political symbolism was enough reason to justify trying to make the Constitution say something that it did not say. In our preoccupation with specific issues and specific groups, it is easy to forget that all groups stand to lose as Americans when the law 
and is undermined as judicial activism surrounds all laws with a large and growing penumbra of uncertainty. Yeah. Do you want to summarize your I think I have 10 minutes, was it? I have about a minute, another, another minute. Fine. No one loses more than the black community when their children are not educated or when judicial undermining of law enforcement makes their streets far more unsafe than they were 40 years ago. Legal principles are not just abstract intellectual matters. They are often far more important to far more people than the specific issues which provoke single issue organizations to venom and propaganda. If more people will look beyond this propaganda to the enduring principles which should guide the law of the nation, I am sure that more will support the nomination of Robert Bork to the Supreme Court. I don't think that judicial activism has been beneficial to minorities. Uh, one of the reasons that is what I've mentioned earlier, that it's extremely hard for kids in many ghettos to get a decent education today, let's say as decent an education as I got in the center of Harlem 40 years ago, because the disruption is so much greater today and there's so little you can do about it. If you expel more black males from some schools than you expel uh, uh, Asian females, that becomes a court case. Uh, you have the American Civil Liberties Union intervening in these places. There were students, uh, there were parents actually, parading, I believe, in Chicago with signs saying American Civil Liberties Union keep out because they wanted their kids to get educated. That couldn't be done if you're going to have to due process every uh, uh, disruptive student. I think one of the great handicaps that uh, blacks and other minorities face across the country is that they are systematically mismatched with universities in the admissions process. That is, if, if Harvard feels that it must have X percent of blacks, and if the pool is such that they can't get X percent of blacks at the same level as the rest of the Harvard students, they're going to take those blacks who would have succeeded in some state university and bring them to Harvard where many of them will fail. Or MIT is a better example, that the average black student at MIT is in the bottom 10 percent of M MIT students in math, but he is in the top 90 percent of all American students in math because MIT students are so phenomenal in mathematics. Something like one-fourth of all the black students going to MIT do not graduate. You're talking about a pool of people who score at the 90th percentile in math whom you are artificially turning into failures by mismatching them with the school. The problem is not whether you believe that school desegregation should have ended. I, I believe it should have ended long before. George Bork believes it should have ended long before. What he and what I have objected to are the principles used in that decision because those principles take on a life of their own and they come back to haunt you in other areas. Obviously this, this old phrase, the hard cases make bad law, uh, derived from that fact. You dream up a principle to reach this result and then the principle has a life of its own. So the principle of desegregating the no, school. No, that wasn't the principle. The principle was the reason that they picked for it. Was well, that that's was all I'm saying. You, okay, the reasons they picked yes. of desegregating the schools, you and Judge Bork agree were the wrong principles and they should have not. So the, sh the court shouldn't have done that. The, no, no, the, the court should have done it. Oh, okay. Both of us have said the court should have done it. I see. And in my case, and I think in his case, the court should have done it a lot sooner. How? They should, have, they should have ruled that it wasn't equal protection of the law because nobody in his right mind believed that there was equal protection of the law in the Jim Crow era uh, of, the, of these okay. schools. I'm just trying to figure out yeah. what you're saying. Then this, you see, this is what bothers me. People are talking about how Judges should be sensitive to this particular group or yeah. that particular group. And if that means anything, if it means he's applying the law differently, that's precisely how blacks were held down for generations in the South. I see. So by literacy applying the law differently. So literacy tests, as long as they were equally applied, yeah. are, are all right. Sure. So I thought you thought. I gather from your comments about MIT and Harvard that you don't think there's enough blacks out there who are qualified to fill the number of vacancies allotted for them in those schools. Is that right? Is that what you're well, saying? Well, the word, word qualify is really misleading. I got it. So, but my point is, you believe there are not enough black women and men out there that are the same as white women and men to be able to go through Harvard and MIT. Yes, what you're it's saying? question what I think is a factual matter. So factually, uh, but, you're oh. saying factually there are not enough. Factually, this study's already been done by Clipgard at Harvard, and he's, the, the figures are all there. Anyone can look right. them up. Okay, no, I, 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 I just want to hear from you. Mm -hmm. I, I want to know what you're thinking.